Bully for You, Teddy Roosevelt, Chapter 4. As it turned out, those Arctic owls had known what they were doing. The winter of 1886-1887 was a killer. Snow lay over the prairies, three to four feet deep, drifting as high as 100 feet. The person did not dare to stay outside for too long for fear of being frozen to death, and of course, the cattle had a rough time. Teddy didn't go west until April after the snows had melted, and although he'd heard all about the disasters, hearing, what, hearing was not the same as seeing. Riding the range, he came upon mounds of skeletons, cattle that had huddled together against the storms and been buried alive in the drifts. One carcass hung on a tree where the snow had left it. The few surviving cattle were no more than skin and bones, walking corpses. Even the land, brown and bare, looked as if it had been visited by death. I'm bluer than indigo about the cattle, Teddy wrote, Bamie. It's even worse than I feared. I wish I was sure I would lose no more than half the money I invested out here. In the end, Teddy sold out, losing $50,000 from his $85,000 investment. But at the time, all he wanted was to get back east. Any idea of living on the ranch was gone, and rather than sell Sagamore Hill, Teddy and Edith decided simply to economize. They would sell part of the land in Teddy's hunting horse, raise chickens, grow their own vegetables, and cut down on the entertaining that Teddy loved to do. And Teddy would write, hold up at his desk in his third floor gun room, Teddy finished a biography of Governor Morris, prominent statesman in Revolutionary War days. Then he started on his biggest and most successful project, a four-volume history entitled The Winning of the West. He loved writing about the West, especially the battles, but it wasn't easy just to sit still describing heroic deeds and American heroes. He considered himself a true American, manly, red-blooded, honest, patriotic, and he wanted a chance to prove it. He was a doer, a talker, a persuader, a mover, and a he longed above all to be close to the center of action. Since his early years when he had struggled against his body, he had found satisfaction in the very act of struggle. To be at his best, he needed to be fighting for something. And just as he had once wanted to improve himself, now he wanted to improve his country. I would like to go into politics, he admitted. His chance came in 1889 when a Republican, Benjamin Harris, Harrison, became president and offered Teddy a job on the Civil Service Commission. He would be responsible for seeing that certain positions in the government, customs, postal services, for instance, were given out according to merit, not because of political or personal favoritism. He would have to make sure that there was no cheating on civil service examinations. Teddy's friends thought the job was beneath him, but not Teddy. He was delighted. The way he pronounced, the way he pounced down on the first syllable gave the word a joyfulness it didn't ordinarily have. Ordinarily have. He sniffed corruption in the air. Good. Here was a chance to set things straight. So off he went to Washington, bounded up the steps of the Civil Service building, flung open the door to his office, and grinning his famous toothy grin, announced loudly that he had arrived. Just as he expected, there was corruption. The Indianapolis, in Indianapolis, in Milwaukee, in Baltimore, wherever he found it, he went after it, cracking down on wrongdoers, no matter how important they might be. Theodore Roosevelt made headlines and enemies, and he loved every minute. His only trouble, President Harrison said, was that he wanted to put an end to all the evil in the world between sunrise and sunset. But why not? Teddy would have asked. In a jaunty straw hat, he whistled as he walked to work. But when he came to the White House, he would occasionally pause. My heart would beat a little faster, he confessed much later, as the thought came to me that possibly, possibly, I would someday occupy it as president. So far, however, this was only a boy's dream. Every boy wanted to be president, he believed, but Teddy knew that he had stirred things up too much to expect any help up the political ladder. Don't you know, he asked, I have made an enemy of every professional politician in the United States. I can't have any political prospects. And yet, in 1895, he was asked again to run for mayor of New York. He was wild to accept, but Edith said a firm no. They couldn't afford to pay for a campaign, and if Teddy lost, what then? Reluctantly, Teddy gave up the idea, but, yet, but he was so disappointed he couldn't settle down to his old job with any enthusiasm. Besides, after a little more than six years, he felt he had done what he could do. He was restless, bored, eager for any challenge. But Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, was now in the White House. If Teddy didn't run for mayor, how could he hope for a change of job? Of course, he had diversions. At least once a year, he went to Dakota country to hunt. He needed regular doses of western wildness, even though the wildness was not what, what, what it once had been. He came back from a trip in 1887 reporting that trees were being cut down carelessly, animals were being slaughtered by swinish, swinish game butchers, and the wilderness was in danger. Obviously, Teddy did not consider himself a game butcher. Even though he loved to hunt, it was on a small scale, a sportsman's pursuit, nothing that could endanger the environment, nothing like the wholesale killing that was going on and had been going on for years. Indians had killed herds of buffalo just for their tongues, which they sold as a delicacy.
Travelers shot buffalo out of train windows as target practice. People were chopping down trees and selling the lumber as if they expected the supply to last forever. Teddy knew this was happening, and as he rode through the Badlands, he was shocked at how quickly the region was being stripped of its glory. Not only was the big game gone, but beavers were disappearing. Ponds were drying up. Grass was giving way to desert. As soon as he returned to the east, Roosevelt, desperate to save the West from ex extinction, founded the Boone and Crockett Club, dedicated to the preservation of wilderness in America. Largely through the club's influence, legislation was passed to take proper care of Yellowstone National Park, to protect sequoia trees in California, to set aside nature reserves for bird and sea life, and to limit, limit the shooting of big game. The club also took steps to stop the hounding of deer, driving them into the water where they could be easily where they would be easy to kill, and against blinding or jacklighting game at night. For the rest of his life, Theodore Roosevelt worked for conservation. He thought it sentimental to ban hunting altogether, so he continued to hunt, but conservation came first. Teddy had his family, an endless diversion. In late 1895, Teddy was 37 years old, and his family was almost complete. In addition to Alice, who was now 11, there were young Ted Jr., 8, Kermit, 6, Ethel, 4, and Archie, 1. Quentin would arrive two years later. Ever the boy himself, Teddy created an, an ideal home for his children at Sagamore Hill, modeled in many respects on his own boyhood home. The children had their pony, Grant, just as he had, had, he had once had. Christmas, the high point of his early years, followed the same pattern for his children as it had for him. Up at dawn, they would scramble on their parents' bed and open their stockings. Then together, they would troop downstairs to the parlor, where a Christmas tree was waiting and where tables, one for each child, were piled high with their big presents. Christmas should be magic, Teddy believed. Ch childhood should be magic, spilling over with animals, picnics, games, and laughter. A friend once said of Teddy, you must always remember that he's about six. And indeed, among his own children, Teddy abandoned himself to the joys of childhood. Down on all fours, he would play bear with the younger children, or tickly. On the way upstairs, he might be ambushed, and then he would either have to put up his hands or figure out a way to escape. On any summer day at Sagamore Hill, a person might catch Teddy, together with his children, crawling through haystack tunnels in the barn following the leader. Or he might be up in a tree, or out on the raft where he'd be organizing a game of stagecoach. He would assign a, po a position in a stagecoach to each child, whip, driver, old lady, passengers, and then he'd tell a story. Whenever he mentioned a position, the child in that position would have to jump off the raft into the water. When he said stagecoach, everyone would have to jump off. The children considered Teddy their playmate, but he was generally the leader. It was this boyish spirit in him that people found hard to resist, even though they might disagree with him. It was the same spirit that turned him into a dragon slayer, determined to overcome all evil, as President Harrison said, between sunrise and sunset. So perhaps it was not surprising that in the spring of 1895, the new reform-minded reform mayor of New York City should ask Teddy Roosevelt to be the city's police commissioner. Everyone knew that the New York City Police Department needed to be cleaned up, and Teddy agreed that he was just the man to do it. Over the years, he had learned that the first thing to do when he wanted to bring about reform was to get attention. He was an expert at this. Back in New York City, he went into high gear, made friends with two reporters whose office was directly across the street from his, and began, to count, began a countdown on corruption. The police chief himself, Teddy discovered, had so many friends in the underworld that he overlooked whatever crimes he chose. In addition, all over the city, officers accepted bribes rather than enforced certain laws. Teddy went on a rampage, but whenever he was going to fire a high-ranking officer, he first stuck his head out of the window and let loose a loud cowboy hi yi yi I call. This was his signal to the reporters across the street that he was about to make news. When Teddy said he would enforce the law, he really meant it. He would see to it that every patrolman paid a strict attention to business on his nightly beat. Dressed in a long overcoat, his collar turned up, his hat pulled down, Teddy stalked the streets at night on the lookout for patrolmen who were neglecting their duty. Slipping off for a nap or a drink or loafing on the corner with friends, Teddy would sometimes go 40 hours without sleep, but what fun he had. Here he was, acting like a storybook character, stealthy, sly, pursuing evil in the dark of night. Patrolmen soon learned to look closely at any man in dark clothes with his hat pulled down. If he had a set of large white teeth, they knew they should look lively. Teddy wore a bright pink shirt to work these days and a black silk cummerbund with tassels reaching to his knees. As always, he was, as a friend said, creating his own limelight, and indeed he enjoyed the attention he was getting. It was only when he decided to enforce the law against selling liquor on Sunday that he ran into trouble. This was such an unpopular law that no one had bothered to enforce it. Teddy himself thought it was a foolish law, but still, it was a law, and he was determined to see that it was obeyed. But what a rumpus this made. Teddy got all the publicity he ever wanted now. Papers throughout the country, and even one in London, wrote about him, most applauding him, but not those in New York City. Here everyone seemed to be against him, even members of his police board. 
He received two letter bombs in the mail, and a newspaper described him as the most despised and at the same time best loved man in the country, one who was bound to go higher, mayor, the paper suggested, governor, president. All Teddy would admit after a year of his grimy job, as he called it now, after all the scrapping on the police board, was that he'd like to get into national politics. This was 1896, an election year, with William McKinley running for president on the Republican ticket. When he was asked to campaign for McKinley, he jumped at the chance. Grinning and waving and snapping out his words, he addressed one audience after another. He just hoped that McKinley noticed and that, if elected, McKinley would remember and appoint him to a position in government. Teddy didn't expect a cabinet post. What he really wanted was to be assistant secretary of the Navy. Ever since Teddy had been at Harvard, writing about the Navy's part in the War of 1812, he had been fascinated by warships. He was convinced that if the United States had been properly prepared at sea, there wouldn't have been a War of 1812. He was also convinced that the Navy was still not prepared for war, and he believed that war was coming. At this time, Cuba belonged to Spain and was ruled by a Spanish governor who dealt with protesting Cubans by shooting them, unarmed men and women alike, and sending them to prison camps. Teddy didn't, even, didn't like even the idea that Spain was in the Western Hemisphere, but if the nation wanted to free the Cubans and get Spain out, it would need a strong navy. Teddy was itching to get the navy ready. He was also itching to get into a war if it came along. How would, he know, how would he ever know what war was like unless he fought in one? How would he know if he measured up? When McKinley was elected, Teddy's friends went to him and urged him to give Teddy the post he wanted, but McKinley wasn't sure. He wanted peace, he said, and Roosevelt is always in such a state of mind. He was too pugnacious. It must have been hard for Teddy's friends to reassure the president that Teddy could be peaceful, but apparently they did. Teddy got the job. When he arrived in Washington in April 1897, he told a reporter, I'm sedate now, and he almost convinced the president and his own boss, Secretary of the Navy, John D. Long, that perhaps he had become sedate. He was charming, comparatively quiet, but all the while he was making friends with those in Washington who believed, as he did, that the United States should become a world power. It was not only Cuba that they wanted to set free. They wanted to annex the independent Hawaiian Islands, which were threatened, they believed, by Japan. Then there were the Philippine Islands in the Far East. They also belonged to Spain, so if Cuba were freed, the Philippines should be freed too. Teddy was on fire to start things moving, but for almost two months, he kept quiet. When he was asked to give a speech to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island on June 2nd, he could keep still no longer. Readiness was his theme. The only way to keep peace was to be ready for war, he insisted. The only way to be ready for war was to enlarge the Navy. He talked about hard-fighting virtues. He sneered at cowardice, and before he was through, he had used the word war 62 times. It was a rousing patriotic speech which delighted newspapers and inspired people generally to think of America in grander terms. Apparently, it also encouraged some senators and President McKinley to do something about Hawaii. On June 16th, the president approved a treaty to annex Hawaii and made it a territory of the United States. The treaty wasn't ratified until a year later. Secretary of the Navy Long, however, was not pleased with Teddy's speech. He had gone too far with his private opinions, Long said, but then Long went on vacation and wasn't around to keep track of what went on. He wasn't there at the end of September when Theodore Roosevelt presented the president with his own plan for freeing Cuba. Within 48 hours after war was declared, fighting ships should leave Key West, Florida for Cuba. They should be followed with a landing force. At the same time, the fleet in the Pacific should blockade the Philippines, preventing Spanish ships from leaving and possibly taking the capital, Manila. Teddy hadn't finished. On the night before Long was due back in Washington, he intercepted a letter to Long, recommending that a certain Commodore, William Chandler, be appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Asiatic Station. Roosevelt was horrified at the idea of this timid man attacking Manila, and in a lightning move, he got McKinley to write a long note, write a long, write a note to Long, asking that Commodore George Dewey be given this post. Again, Long was unhappy, but what could you do with a man like Roosevelt? From this time, events themselves dictated what was to come. December 8, 1897, Commodore Dewey sailed for Hong Kong to be within striking distance of the Philippines. January 12, 1898, a riot broke out in Havana, and Americans worried about the safety of their fellow citizens there, not Secretary Long. He was impatient with the warriors and with Theodore Roosevelt. He actually takes the thing seriously, Long wrote. He bores me. Teddy did take it seriously. He wrote to the head of the New York State National Guard, offering his services in case of war. He would write again, remember, I want to go. January 25th, the American battleship Maine dropped anchor in Havana Harbor. This was a friendly visit, President McKinley explained, but it was also a warning. February 15th, the Maine was blown up. Two American officers and 264 sailors were killed. Did something go wrong on the ship to cause the explosion, or was it set from the outside by a submarine minor torpedo? McKinley ordered an investigation, but Teddy Roosevelt said he had no doubt about what had happened. It was an act of dirty treachery on the part of the Spaniards.
March. McKinley was still trying to avoid war at any cost, and Spain showed signs of willingness to negotiate, but it was too late for the American people. Too late for Teddy Roosevelt, who told friends that McKinley had no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. March 28th. The report on the investigation of the main disaster was published, although now it's generally thought that the explosion was due to an accident on shipboard. At the time, it was reported to have been caused by an external device. That was all the Americans wanted to know. Remember the main, they cried from one end of the country to the other. It was a war cry. April 11th, President McKinley gave in to popular sentiment and asked Congress to declare war. On April 25th, the formal declaration was made. Three weeks later, Teddy Roosevelt resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy so that he'd be ready to fight. His friends told him he was crazy. He was throwing away his political future. Secretary Long said he was acting like a fool. Edith was against it. She was recovering from a serious and expensive illness. Young Ted had been sick. There was a five-month-old baby, Quentin, in the house. How could they manage without Teddy's salary? Still, anyone who understood Teddy Roosevelt would know he had to go. He had spent his life fulfilling his boyhood dreams, and war, a just war, he would have said, was such a dream, the ultimate test of manliness, of patriotism, of bodily endurance. Even so, he felt he needed to explain himself. In case of a serious war, he wrote later, he wanted to be able to tell his children why he had fought in it, not why he hadn't fought in it, as his father had done, he might have added. This seemed to remain a sore point with Teddy all of his life. Again, he said that he was the kind of person who couldn't preach one thing and do another. This was true. He was that kind of person. On the other hand, he wrote a friend, I say quite seriously that I shall not go for my own pleasure. I like life very much. I've always led a joyous life, so I shall not go into a war with any undue exhilaration of spirits. This was only partly true. Teddy was exhilarated when he was given permission to raise a volunteer cal cavalry regiment. Because of his inexperience, he chose to be second in, second in command, a lieutenant colonel, and gave first place to his good friend, an old Indian fighter, Leonard Wood, before going to Texas, where his regiment was to train. Teddy ordered a light tan uniform trimmed in bright yellow, took out life insurance, and bought 12 pairs of steel rim glasses to be tucked away in every pocket of his uniform, even and even in his campaign hat. If he was going to fight in a war, he wanted to see what he was doing. Moreover, he wanted to be on time for it. He was terrified that somehow he would not be in, in on the first expedition. It will be awful, he said, if we miss the fun.